All right, Jennifer, can you go to the next slide? Great, thank you. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. My name is Sarah Husky with 3C Ren. I have started this recording, or which will be uh, posted on 3C Ren's on demand page. We have Jennifer Rennick and Grant Murphy with us today from Imbalance Green Consulting to talk about the 2022 energy code for non residential projects. Before we get going, I have just a few slides to run through. Uh, just a, a reminder, we ask that everyone make sure they're on mute. Uh, if you'd like to verbally participate, please raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you to unmute yourself. Uh, we encourage you to participate and ask questions in the chat box. Uh, Grant and myself will be monitoring uh, the chat. Um, and just really briefly for those who might be new um, to this, this course series, uh, we are the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, also known as 3C REN. Uh, we're a collaborative partnership between San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties working to improve energy efficiency in our region by offering free programs and services for building professionals and households. Uh, 3C REN currently offers three programs, uh, the first of which is the Energy Code Connect program, which serves all building professionals and provides training and support and our energy code coach service. Uh, we have uh, Grant Murphy is the lead on that service for us and Jennifer is also a, a code coach as well. Uh, we also have our building performance training program which serves current and prospective building professionals with technical skills and soft skill training. And our third program is the home energy savings uh, which provides rebates for multifamily uh, uh, projects and uh, incentives paid to contractors for single family projects. Um, and with that, I'll just pass things over to Jennifer from Imbalance. Hey, thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, all. Um, just want to, I'll be primarily be doing the speaking, but Grant's going to uh, jump in if there's something I miss, or especially if there's something in the chat that comes up and anyone has a question, uh, feel free to use the chat. And if Grant um, sees something that makes sense for the slides, he'll stop me and we'll go back and we'll uh, review it. Otherwise, I'll keep going or we can save questions to the end. And this, um, to get us going, this is the non-residential portion of our series that we've been doing for Central Coast and Ventura ICC chapters. And next month, we will have Cal Green overview and the 2022 changes. And Sarah, I think folks, if they miss some of the other ones and are interested, they can go on the CEC website and uh, get access to them. Uh, these are all, these are posted to our on-demand page. Yeah, the, the okay. rest of the courses. Yeah. Great. Perfect. And for those of you who are looking for um, ICC credits or AIA credits, uh, we posted today's learning objectives. And okay, I think uh, you can read them and we'll move on from there. Okay, today we're going to cover our energy code reorganization and some key terms for the 2022 code. Some of this is going to be a little bit of a review, especially if you've listened to the other uh, courses in our series, but we like to hit on it each time in case folks are only attending uh, one class. And then we'll touch on some of those high level non-residential changes to the code and we'll flow into some of the major changes for the mandatory measures. Um, some of the changes that are significant for performance and prescriptive code changes. And then we'll highlight a few of the kind of key takeaways for additions and alterations. And then if there's a little time at the end, we will be able to do some questions and answers. So when it comes to the energy code for the 2022 code cycle, it's come into play. The main kind of Emphasis for the California Energy Commission overall is to help 
uh, work with California's goal towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions and moving to cleaner ways to produce our electricity and better ways to um, have uh, gas and propane um, uh, fueled projects. And so part of that is through the encouragement of heat pump technology for both space heating and cooling and water heating and to establish our electric ready requirements for single family multifamily projects and expand PV systems, including battery storage and the standards associated with that, and then strengthening the ventilation standards across all of the occupancy types. For the non-residential portion of the project, um, some of the high level changes is, um, We've got some updates to the envelope and fenestration portion of it. There's been some pretty, pretty significant changes to our HVAC systems for efficiencies, but also we've got heating systems and fans that may or may not be included with outside air ventilation, like dedicated outside air DOAS systems that are now have their own section in the code and are covered under uh, uh, process and acceptance testing where there's been some updates to the indoor and outdoor lighting and there's a couple of new sections now in covered processes which um, specifically includes updates to the computer rooms but also to controlled environmental horticulture spaces which kind of capitalizes on uh, the trend towards building those for cannabis and more recently uh, mushroom production. There's new photovoltaic and battery system requirements specific to non-residential projects for the first time now in our energy code. And we're gonna talk about how high rise residential was kind of removed from the non-residential sections but hotel and motel guest rooms, just to be clear, kind of remain under the non-residential portions. So a little bit of vocabulary and kind of reminder on the reorganization for the code. So under the 2019 code, we basically had sections for all the buildings. Then we had the high-rise residential rolled in with non-residential and hotel motel sections. And then we had all the low rise residential, including multifamily. But now under the 2022 code, we still have that all building sections. Our non residential includes the hotel motel. But now we've singled out single family residential, including duplexes and townhouses that are single family uh, properties. But all of the multifamily, including high rise and low rise and um, um, well, including all your high rise, low rise, mid rise, everything that's multifamily basically now has its own sections. And if you're kind of visual and you get a copy of the slides by the way. So if you're more visually oriented, how um, this is how I think kind of mind mapping it, so to speak. We basically had a section overarching for all the occupancies. And that was chapter one, chapter two, and then we had chapter seven, eight, nine that dealt specifically with low rise residential of any type. And then basically all the other chapters were just anything that wasn't low rise res. And now they've kind of broken it out a little more um, so that we have the multifamily residential type, the single family residential type, and now the not residential sections. Um, so new is the multifamily res. And then today we're gonna focus on kind of the not residential. With that said, there's a few times where I'm gonna point out kind of the overlap with multifamily. And also to be clear, the slides are, we tried to color code them for you. So mandatory requirements gonna show up in orange. 
and our prescriptive component package, which is basically means this is the kind of the checklist approach. Prescriptive approach is often what's required for a lot of projects where you follow every component of the requirement and then that topic complies prescriptively. And if you're working on a project that can benefit from trade-offs, then there's the performance method or essentially the energy modeling approach. And those slides are gonna be color-coded gray. The prescriptive, which we go into a bit, is color-coded co blue. And that's really the baseline for our performance method modeling approach. New to the performance method modeling approach for commercial projects um, is the inclusion of solar PV and battery storage. There are some covered processes that can be uh, modeled now under the performance method. And there's been some changes in the standard design which varies by climate zone and it's now including heat pumps as the baseline so maybe from codes examination or plan check and uh out in the field that may not matter to you so much but if any question comes up on just what's going on with the energy code this is this is what's happening on that computer modeling mode, when those of you are doing a plan check on the Title 24 code compliancy, if you get a, a performance method, you, what you're going to see now is two types of metrics that need to be used to show compliance. And TDV energy continues to be kind of the, the metric that we're used to for non-residential projects. However, they've added what's called source energy budget. And that is an additional metric that is really trying to capture the carbon emissions or other pollution greenhouse gas emissions associated with the production, procurement, and distribution of a particular source of energy. So really, it does a little bit more than um, account for when the energy is used, which TDV used, was doing, still doing time-dependent valuation. And now we're talking about how clean, essentially, is that energy that you're receiving at the site. And so what that means for us is that you're going to see TDV if does it pass on that level and then you're going to see this source energy does it pass on that level and so what it's going to look like in the software now and this is an example of office building from cbetcom is that you've got an efficiency score TDV like we've always used to having passes Okay, if it passes, you pass that portion of it. Then the total TDV takes into account those PVs and batteries when they're required. So now in total, are you meeting that requirement? But it says pass, yep, you got it. And source energy, now the proxy for carbon. That also has to show a passing score. Um, another thing I think worth pointing out on the compliance forms on the nomenclature is that a lot of the non-residential, all those forms for high-rise residential would say NRCC or NRCA or NRCI, depending on um, whether it was for compliance or installation or acceptance or verification. Now, under this new code cycle, NR will still be used for the high-rise multifamily residences, even though technically it's not considered a non-res uh, you know, project. And what they've added is LM for the low-rise multifamily projects. So now our residential types and our non-residential types will follow this kind of nomenclature for 
the compliance forms. And you'll no longer see those CF1Rs and all that for multifamily. So could be a little confusing, but just kind of heads up, FYI, your, all your multifamily is going to have this sort of nomenclature and as well as the non-res. Now we'll kind of go back to the non-res side of it. For our mandatory measures, we've had a few minor updates to things, but there's been some pretty significant changes to the HVAC systems and the controls. And then, like I said, there's some new sections for indoor horticulture and computer rooms. Generally speaking, there's been um, under the sections 110 through 110.12, it's been update to equipment efficiencies across the board. And most of these will affect the non-residential occupancy types. So just greater efficiency, that's gonna fall under, you know, purview of the mechanical engineer. Um, what is embedded kind of with that is, yes, increased HVAC efficiencies for cooling towers, certain types of cooling systems, furnaces, and boilers now starting in, uh, just started in uh, January. But there's also brand new tables for dedicated outdoor air systems, computer room units, and heat pump and heat recovery chillers. So we'll hit on a couple of those things coming up. But those dedicated outdoor air systems, the reason that's been in, put into the code is we're seeing a lot of um, projects now being designed for ductless heat pump systems. And in order to meet all our fresh outdoor air re requirements, they're needing dedicated outdoor air systems to provide that ventilation air. So that's another category now that needs to be um, uh, looked at. Under the fenestration or windows, it's not a whole lot has changed. And really the big takeaway is that all, almost all the projects now will be using NFRC rated windows and fenestration projects throughout the building. So what's changed is that there was a formula that could be used to show that vertical fenestration or windows could comply with the standards but that formula has been taken away and the big push is to have everything nrc nfrc rated with the uh, demand response lighting and controlled receptacles again it on the surface, it doesn't seem like too much has changed at all, but if you kind of dig into it a little bit more, there's now a change where it says lighting systems of total installed lighting power of 4,000 watts or greater will be subject to these requirements. And previously, it was stated that a project with 10,000 square feet or more would be subject to it. So they've taken, a, taken it away from looking at how big the building is to actually how many watts are being installed. And that 4,000 watts is going to have a, um, an impact. It's predicted that it will help bring down energy use by about 15%. And then there's still mandatory controls for indoor lighting where multi-level controls are required and demand response um, controls are still in place. For the indoor lighting controls, again, it's sort of like, okay, on the surface, we know we're gonna have indoor lighting controls and it appears too much hasn't changed other than maybe the threshold triggering those controls a little bit sooner than they would have under the previous code cycle. So now they're shut off controls for offices, um, you know, greater than 250 square feet. That, yeah, that was a part of it before, but now there's some new requirements that go along with it. And there's some automatic daylighting controls 
that are now mandatory in the secondary daylight zone. So again, this a lot of this stuff is going to come under how the electrical engineer has designed the project to meet these requirements. But I think it's good for folks to realize that a lot of these requirements have become a little bit more um, I, stringent isn't quite the right word, but they trigger sooner in order to reduce energy overall so that California can meet the overall building energy reduction goals that it has. For HVAC ventilation, um, under the previous code cycle, most of the ventilation controls really had applied to constant volume systems, but now they're being applied to variable air volume systems and they're being applied to uh, the dedicated outdoor air systems. The ventilation rate itself is still based on ASHRAE 62.1 and based on the equations that can be found in um, section 120.1 for minimum ventilation rate. Duct leakage is now being triggered sooner. It was previously only a prescriptive component requirement, but now it's been moved to being a mandatory requirement. And when you have a conditioned floor area of less than 5,000 square feet, that duct testing needs to be no more than 6% leakage and must be done by a PERS rater. So, you know, that's a little bit more of a requirement that you might see or when it comes to collecting, you know, the applicable forms, you're going to have other forms that might be done by a HERS rater or it might need to be done by an acceptance test technician. And there are still exemptions for uh, this requirement, such as healthcare facilities or certain other uh, projects that won't um, that won't meet this section, but instead will be required to meet the mechanical code, uh, California Mechanical Code section six zero three point one zero point one to be specific. Oh, and Grant, if there's anything in the chat or if any, if just let me know or if there's anything that comes up on your end that you're wondering about or want to interject, feel free. Yep, nothing uh, yet. Okay. Now, uh, in the code for 2022, there's now, uh, a, they're specifically addressing process boilers, compressed air systems, and steam traps. And really, the kind of the main takeaway for this is that the energy code, I mean, yeah, the energy code, but California Energy Commission, they uh, do a lot of case study work and a lot of analysis to understand, and they work with the utilities in this, to understand where is the energy going? Where is their potential to save energy? How can we improve um, the ability for the maintenance folks and the people operating facilities to have a successful project. And so one of the places that was identified is steam traps. So unless you're working on really big buildings, this may not, you know, may not come up, but for those folks who do have really large buildings, there's new requirements now for those steam traps for default diagnostics and other efficiency requirements. There's also um, some new monitoring and testing and pipe size requirements for compressed air. And there's also uh, some new requirements for new boiler uh, with an in in input capacity greater than um, 5 million, which you know is significant if you're working on that scale because it used to be triggered at, at 10 million BTU hour. For computer rooms, which we see a lot, even in our Tri-County region, um, 
And this specifically is for computer rooms that have a 20 watts of square foot of connected power density load. And these computer rooms now have new HVAC controls and efficiency requirements, including um, that reheat coils shall prevent reheating and recooling and simultaneous heating. Um, there's some new requirements on um, how the humidification shall uh, be designed and what kind of equipment can be used. And there uh, also just more language about the variable fan controls when mechanical cooling capacities of you know, 60 K BTU hour is uh, specified. The new mandatory measures, new section for controlled environmental horticulture was really kind of uh, created with a focus on cannabis growing. And just to be clear, so this wouldn't include spaces, for example, if decorative plants are grown, but they're really, we're trying to target the high density, high energy intensity production growth of cannabis and other um, products but really it's mostly about cannabis <laughs> and so uh, there's specific uh, requirements for the high photosynthetic photon lighting and its efficacy and the kind of dimming and time clock controls and other requirements such that the conditioned greenhouse must must have at least two glazing layers, for example. And so what that looks like on the code kind of enforcement side of it or plan check side of it is that these new um, processes, steam traps, and controlled environmental horticulture, um, these things have been added now as a scope for the NRCC PRC E forms, which are the compliance forms for process loads. So this form is going to look a little different. And then they've also added more specifically the pool and spa requirements, which really are directed towards multifamily projects. But again, since the forms for multifamily and non-res are kind of sharing a nomenclature, this form also includes that. And what that looks like uh, for the kind of information that's going to be asked for, for example, on the environmental uh, controlled horticulture spaces, is that dehumidification that we talked about it's that lighting efficacy for the grow lights specifically we talked about lighting controls and the opaque envelope and the glazing requirements while we're on this i do want to point out that also very new to 2022 is that many of the paper and form fillable pdfs are not available there they are in certain for certain types of um, acceptance testing if it's not by a uh, as someone who's designated as an att but there are certain uh forms that are form fillable but there's just a, only a few so most of these forms are going to be generated through energy code ace and the California Energy Commission even has some links when you go to those forms, it's gonna link you back to Energy Code Ace. But um, from the planning building department side of it to kind of get up to speed on what the new forms are gonna look like, you can still go to the California Energy Commission website and get the sample forms like this. They're not, they just show the heading and the topics and how it's going to be organized. There's instructions that go with it as if it's form fillable, but it's basically going to look like this, but give you an idea of the kinds of information you're going to be receiving for the Title 24s for plan check. Okay, so 
under the new construction, prescriptive and performance. Again, minor changes to the envelope and lighting, service hot water, and then some major changes when it comes to some of the space conditioning systems, namely the DOAS systems and the solar, electric, and battery storage. The, um, this part of the code still organized the same way in that we have a section that's just general, the next section that hits on the performance approach, and then the third section, 140.2, is the prescriptive approach. And then after that, it goes into the different uh, kind of topics within the prescriptive measures, your envelope, space conditioning, water heating, indoor lighting, outdoor lighting, signs, covered processes, which now we just hit on a lot of it's mandatory, and our photovoltaic and battery storage systems. Uh, some of the more kind of minor changes is on roofing products and solar reflectance index. I put this in here for you kind of as a uh, just a quick cheat sheet. You'll get a copy of the slides, but really the main takeaways is that um, some of the climate zones got a little bit of an upgrade. So there's new requirements for steep slope roofs for climate zones two and four through 16. So four, five, six, seven, that's San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara and Ventura County. So they'll be affected. And then for the milder climates for six, seven and eight, you know, down in Santa Barbara, Ventura, you're going to have some new requirements for the low slope trade-offs for the age solar reflectance. And then um, remember the high rise res has been removed and there's some separate sections now for hotel, motel and the relocatable public schools, which, you know, kind of follows the old code. Uh, structure in that sense. For the envelope changes, again, I just I public I put the whole table in here that shows a strike through on what the old code was, and then an underline that is the new code requirement. So you could kind of see for yourself what's changed. But just to highlight it, there are some new lower minimum mu factors for metal framed buildings, which I'll explain the significance of that in just on the next slide. There's some um, higher minimum requirements on the age solar reflectance and thermal emittance for the roofing products, which we just mentioned. And there's a new requirement across all climate zones that an air barrier is now required for those projects. So that could be significant. But again, this is part of the prescriptive package. So if, you, if you're dealing with a performance approach and computer modeling, um, some of these things may not come into play. But prescriptively, this is what is now the baseline for performance. And what some of these new um, requirements mean is essentially for the metal framed walls, the new U factor means that you're most likely seeing R13 bad insulation between studs with a half an inch of continuous rigid insulation, for example, or you might see a metal stud with that has an R8, which could be about two inches of continuous exterior insulation. And with the computer performance modeling, it's possible to um, trade off some of that as long as you're meeting your minimum, minimum requirements. For vertical fenestration, a lot of the, rec the actual uh, NFRC rated values haven't changed too much, but what is different is that they've now taken those requirements for Windows and specified what the requirement is per climate zone 
versus under the old previous code cycle and the ones prior, it was all based on the type of window you had. So it wouldn't matter which climate zone you're in for your curtain wall or storefront system, you'd have to meet one value. And now if you look at the chart real carefully, you can see that certain climate zones have a slightly lower U value, meaning they have to be more efficient. So that's true for climate zone seven and climate zone one, for example. So climate zones nine and 11 through 15 have new values. So we've got nine down in Ventura County that can be triggered and then climate zones one and seven on the storefront. So for most of our climate zones on the central coast, it hasn't changed, but it's good to be aware of. For the space conditioning systems, um, what is significant here is that wherever it's been shown to be cost effective, heat pumps are now the new baseline. And this comes into play based on um, single zone systems that are less than the 240,000 BTU hour size systems. So that includes a lot of systems. And then it's going to depend on the occupancy type and the climate zone. And then that's going to determine what you're allowed to do for that space. So just take, for example, if you have office building, financial institution, library spaces, and you're in climate zones one through 15, which is gonna include all our climate zones in our tri-county region, the new baseline is a heat pump. And um, if you do prescriptively, you're gonna see a heat pump in there. If it's performance, you could trade it away to do something else, but you're going to be compared to the efficiency of a heat pump. Along with that, there's new fan power budgets, which again, from code compliance side of it, if you're looking at does the project meet the prescriptive requirements, that's all going to be uh, detailed out in the NRCC forms, but I think it's uh, just good to be aware of that this is something that the California Energy Commission has been working on, and this mostly will come into play with how the mechanical engineer and the developers move forward for the project. But there's now some very specific requirements, and uh, it's very very, um, how do I put it? Mm, it's all, it's kind of granular. So this is just an excerpt, but they're going to go in and be looking at, okay, how many uh, floor spaces is it serving? What type of filter? Is it a MERV 13 to MERV 16 filter upstream of the thermal conditioning equipment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then with that, there's very specific requirements for those fan loads dep depending on the fan size and the type of system. I think that kind of, you know, for a lot of us, the main takeaway is, oh, the mechanical engineer and your energy model are going to have a little bit more to deal with because all of this is nuanced. From a plans examiner side of it, you're just going to see, does their system as model meet the requirements, yay or nay? And uh, in some cases, what it's going to mean is that you're going to have see some more uh, acceptance testing and some of the uh, certificates of installation have really changed. It's no longer like a form where it's just kind of blank and folks wrote in what it was they were checking. Now we've got specific um, certificates of installation that are specific to the type of system. The economizers, again, have been updated to uh, look at the cooling air handler threshold, and there's trade-offs, there's new exceptions, and this is, again, tied into a dedicated outdoor air system with exhaust heat recovery. 
and there's going to be very uh very specific requirements so the real takeaway here is that there's just a broadening application of these requirements for economizers even for lower capacity sized units and that is the new part of the code is just when you go to a project now or a project comes in it used to be that only very big projects would have some of these requirements now even our small ones so like a cooling capacity capacity of less than 54,000 BTU hour that's like a residential sized unit so you're going to be seeing a lot of this come up for even our small uh, office projects a prescriptive change along the kind of hand in hand with some of those mandatory changes is the high capacity space heating with gas boiler systems and there's certain triggers for this but again if you've got a gas boiler system this is a, a fairly large project but it could be um, you know associated with maybe a large industrial project as well kind of you know it's sort of a design implication here really is that you might see this be triggered on some of the projects you're doing a plan check for but it also is sort of um a challenge it's sort of a put it out there a challenge for the mechanical engineer also is if they're going to meet these requirements by designing a system that has smaller capacity boilers and using more than one of them or do they use the larger capacity and then it triggers all this but the bottom line is that the california energy commission was looking for certain climate zones that made the most sense to by sense and i mean cost effectiveness to modify this design so that they use a much higher minimum thermal efficiency around 90 percent so it's just it's going to be better and it triggers one through six climate zones and then picks up again at nine through 14. so most of us in the tri-county region will be affected by this for that scale project and then kind of back to that dedicated outdoor air systems prescriptively one of the kind of main requirements here or the main intention is that it was meant to limit reheating and conserving energy so i'm not 100 percent sure on everyone on the audience and all that are listening to it but grant and i both have had questions come up about this because uh, some of the mechanical engineers have said some of the equipment they like to use they're having a hard time getting it to comply under the new requirements but part of the reason is because these new requirements are trying to get rid of reheating and what that means is you're pulling in a certain amount of air you're going to be having now condition it or it's leaving the space and you've just wasted energy as that warm air let's say you're in heating mood that warm air leaves the space and you just sent warm air out the building but you're introducing really cold air so now you've got to heat that cold air for that makeup system and then it goes on from there it's just very nuanced um, this is going to apply to ervs hrvs and the split system DOAS. And ERV, HRV might be a new term to folks. So uh, here's just one example of a kind of a small scale ERV, which is energy recovery ventilation or HRV, heat recovery ventilation. Um, this is where through these special membranes, the air going out of the building and the air coming inside the building for fresh outside air, they don't literally mix, but they pass through the membrane so that those thin surfaces can transfer their heat to one another 
very easily and thereby um, recapturing some of that heat from the exhaust air. And then it also works the same way uh, for air conditioning mode, but most of the time these are used to capitalize on conserving heat going out of the building. Hey Jennifer, we have a question real yeah. quick. Um, I don't know your first name. G G Noggles asks, um, "Is it the solution to just add a heat recovery, aka fresh air heat exchanger?" I think you mentioned that there was nuance to this, and and he was asking what the nuance is. Oh golly, uh, we don't have time. But there's a list of requirements and then there's you get into a little more and there's like, OK, there's dedicated outdoor air systems. And then, oh, I'm going to show you a picture of like what I mean by some of the different systems that are including the, the concept of heat recovery. And then each type of system has um, some th requirements and things that need to be checked. So, for example, you know, if you're having like your dedicated outside air, just on this slide here, dedicated outside air fan system, um, there's a certain requirement now on the power of that system. And if it's less than one kilowatt, right? And it's got to meet that certain threshold for fan efficiency. And if it's greater than that, it's got to meet some different efficiencies. And there's uh, nuance controls like a uh, second bullet point at the bottom. You know, yeah. it's got to be able to cycle off any zone heating and cooling equipment fans, recirculation pumps, terminal unit heat fans when there's no call for heating sure. or cooling in the zone. Okay. But so there's exceptions. <laughs> so yeah, right. if you're designing the system, you got to really read this to make sure you meet it. But I think from a code compliancy side of it, and if you're just curious about like what kinds of things are going to be asking for, um, this just give you an example. I just took a snippet from section F from the NRCC MEC E form just to say, okay, they're gonna be asking for, um, like if you look at that second, I don't know if you can see my mouse on this part. Um, no. Okay, or if you can see my mouse on this yep, part. Yep, now we can, yep. Okay, so just take a look at this little section, for example, and it you know specifically mentions your DOAS systems. Each one of these sections you're gonna be looking at for the equipment category type and again category type and then the heating outputs cooling outputs and this is all the equipment sizing and the load calculations uh then this is just one part of the table and then it keeps going i think if you're curious you could get um you could go on to the california energy commission and just download this whole form but if you really want to get more into the weeds of what the interview questions would be, you'd need to go on to the Calif I mean, go on to Energy Code ACE. And unfortunately, you can't just look at the whole form on Energy Code ACE. You would have to pretend to be going through the interview process. So that's perfect. Uh, yeah. That's that's a great question too. Uh, the specificity. That's something that you can send into the code coach. We'd be happy to like walk through that on your project or talk about what those specifics of the requirement are associated with a system whatever it might be uh i think that's what jennifer meant with the nuance so yes. feel free to follow up with us feel free to follow up with me directly um, and we can help you however you need yes and then i just did a screenshot too for you guys of just the beginning of the nrca mech 05 a form um which goes through a page uh, it's got multiple pages and it just spells out all the functional testing that would be specific to these hrv erv and doas systems and just to know that now these kinds of systems are going to uh, trigger 
um, acceptance testing technicians. It also overlaps with commissioning in that sense. But even if the whole building isn't commissioned, some of these systems will trigger this. And then this document that you can uh, get from the CEC's website is for informational purposes only. And it says not, can't be used for compliance. So you can see the watermark. But then once the uh, authorized acceptance testing technician has performed this functional testing and gone through this, then they're going to be able to create the official watermarked document that you guys would ask for to show that the project meets these requirements. And that's probably the key takeaway for you all. Um, now some of this other stuff, it's nuanced. The part of the intent here is just to give you an idea that a lot of the, a lot of these systems have been giving engineers and project teams the ability to follow it prescriptively. And that seemed like a good thing and folks were asking for it. So they said, okay, folks wanna be able to do all this prescriptively. So we've created new tables and these new and these form fillable PDFs on Energy Code A site. And again, plans examiner, uh, maybe it doesn't matter what that table is. You just, just know that's kind of what they're going through. And then understand that there are these new sections on exhaust air heat recovery as well. Here's this picture I was trying, I wanted to just show you what that looks like in case you're not sure about it. But let's say, okay, for example, this Daikin unit, it's being used or could be used for a dedicated outdoor air system. But now what you can, what we're looking at is that they have this portion that's added to the unit and it's a heat recovery flywheel. And so it maybe doesn't show up quite that well, but the whole idea is that this piece in here, oh, sorry, I'm putting the arrows on the wrong uh, slide. Let me, uh, let me get this over here for you guys. So this portion right here is the flywheel. And as in this case, we're in kind of a cooling mode. Uh, so as the air is coming in through the unit, it is tempered by this flywheel and we've got exhaust air coming out through the unit so that this flywheel will help uh, temper the incoming air by using the energy from the outgoing air or in the cooling mode, the lack of energy in the outgoing mode. And so that's what, you know, that's kind of a visual of what, what these, um, what these systems look like. And there's exceptions to it. And uh, the controls are specified about when you can use it and the requirements and when you could use it at full design capacity, et cetera. And then kind of on your end again, this is just an excerpt from the sample forms that give you the information, but this exhaust air heat recovery, the compliance form is gonna tell you, you know, the tag, the name on that piece of equipment so you can find it. And then it's supposed to tell you those hours of operation, how many of it there. Um, and then these code requirements of whether you're taking any exemptions and then um, the recovery efficiency. And really, if the form is filled out properly through this interview process on Energy Code ACE, it should be compliant. But this information is there um, as part of like looking at it and uh, looking at the plans. New requirements on domestic hot water and Really, it's introducing heat pumps is what it's introducing. And you don't have to use a heat pump, but heat pumps, for the most part, are going to become the new baseline. And there's large-scale heat pumps, 
and small scale heat pumps. The small scale you might see in the single family, multifamily side, you might see in hotel, motel, and then there's much larger scale that you're gonna see for hospitality, retail, schools. The technology's improved a lot, and a number of these units now also use a very low glo global warming potential refrigerant that is being is now being kind of rolled out as Title 17 continues to roll out the uh, the phasing out of the high global warming uh, refrigerants like 410A. So indoor lighting. There's been some adjustments. Again, this comes back to just your uh, electrical engineers and electrical lighting designers following it. Um, outdoor lighting. It's kind of just, it's like, I don't know, put a pin in it or just make a note that now the outdoor lighting categories are based on the 2010 census. And so now you're going to just, you might see a category called urbanized areas and urban clusters that are a little bit different. So whether the project uh, complies or not is still, those forms are still relatively the same. It's just, we've got some new categories and we're including uh, like security cameras in part of that compliancy. For covered processes, Mm, big change here is that now whoever's designing those computer rooms, and again, it's uh, you know greater than 20 watts per square feet, they actually have to look at the climate zone to determine what that minim, minimum efficiency or COP is on the equipment. And there's some new language for uninterrupted power supplies. Okay, and there's some new equations that go with it. So again, new tables, but from kind of from your side of it, uh, same story. It's a, you can, energy code ACE is where you get the form fillable to show compliance, but you can get the informational forms. And this is another portion of the uh, NRCC PRCE, which is the, process loads, which includes the new computer room requirements. And this gives you an idea of what's going to be asked for. So the new parts, the UPSs, the um, uninterrupted, uninterrupted power supply efficiencies. Solar, brand new requirement um, for non-residential. So we had solar ready before and you had to show solar access. That's pretty much the same. Now you're going to see the acronym SARA for solar access roof area. Just people just say it, the SARA. You still have exemptions to it that if you don't have sun, but now we're going to be seeing the solar installed solar and all the um, forms associated with showing compliance for PVs for groceries, high-rise multifamily, yes, um, office, financial, retail, schools, warehouses, auditorium, convention centers, medical office. Like I list all, I just showed all of them here. Um, someone just said, are there any of them that aren't listed? Yes, but a lot of them are listed and required. However, it's it's um, very specific to the climate zone and the conditioned floor area. So someone's going to have to run these uh, this calculation. And I put this slide in here just to give you an idea of what someone will calculate for the project team. And it's an either or you can have a system that follows the formula based on condition, floor area, climate zone, or it could be based on a PV size as being 14 watts per square foot times the SARA. And that SARA uh, does have to be shown to comply by a CEC approved solar access calculation tool such as helio or um 
Uh, I can't think of any others right off the top of my head, but if you're curious about that yourself, you can go on to the CEC website and look at the programs that have been approved by the California Energy Commission. And this is where, if you have a project where they're taking an exemption or they're gonna use that 14 watts per square foot, then they also are gonna need to show like um, plan sheet or they're supposed to document where you can see those calculations. And then also those calculations would be need to be done by someone who knows how to use the software. There's there's seven of those softwares, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Those and I animals. just like, yeah, Aurora and Helio are, yeah, actually, yeah. are the same, actually, one residential, one non-residential. You're good, I just want to make sure it didn't sound like there was just one option. Yeah, yeah, there's seven. <laughs> and I, I just couldn't remember them all off the top of my head. Um, battery yeah. storage Sorry. is also, Jennifer. oh yeah. Yeah. Um, just just to let you know, we are at time, oh, but I let yeah. the group know that um, for those that can stay, we'll finish running through the slides. Oh, yeah. Um, Sorry, guys. Yeah. OK. Uh, we just have a couple more slides left. Um, same thing for battery storage. If PVs are required, battery storage is required. There are a few exemptions. And this lists some of the exemptions for you, just so you have it handy. There's uh, battery and storage NRCC SAB forms now that need to be filled and that does require um, uh, some acceptance testing as well. And then real quick on the additions, alterations, couple of highlights and really, uh, if the designers side of it, I'd say get the non-res and multifamily compliance manuals because they give a lot of examples of this. And I actually think that this manual is worth reading if you know you're going to be getting into additions, alterations for the plan check side of it. And a lot of the kind of the changes has a lot to do with roofing alterations. And so it's probably worth taking a look at these because there's new insulation requirements for roof alterations and um, re-roofing that's gonna require uh, above deck continuous exterior insulation. Hey, Jennifer, uh, we yeah. have a comment that we're stuck on the PV slide. Can anyone else confirm you're having the same issue? Is this working for anyone else, not working? I see Rob nodding that it's working. It is working. Sorry, G, it sounds like it might be on your side. Yeah, oh, that's too bad. So uh, again, kind of highlight uh, additions, alterations. That's kind of nuanced in the sense that you have to go into it and really look specifically what are you altering on your HVAC system? What exactly are you altering on your ducts? And if you're replacing 75% of the duct system or not, new leakage test requiring, HERS is required, um, specific to the water heaters and what you can do to add addition. And then if, if your project, of course, if the project can't meet those prescriptive requirements, a lot of folks at that point move to the performance method. But with all that said, Grant and I are both uh, on that, code coach uh, availability and it's free to everyone to it's free to all you folks and to your clients and to your customers that come to the counter so send it send them our way for 3c rents code coach service and i'm going to turn this back over to um, sarah and thanks you all for being patient and sorry we ran a few minutes over yeah thanks jennifer um, and yeah, thanks again, everyone, for for sticking with us. Um, just in closing, if we can offer um, AIA and ICC learning units for today's uh, course, so um, feel free to email me uh, your numbers, and I can get those submitted for you. Uh, the recording and the slides will be sent to you via email, uh, and then just right here on the screen is a list of our upcoming courses. 
for the ICC chapter series. We have one more on August 2nd. It's the Cal Green Overview. Um, and yeah, with that, we can can stay on a few more minutes and answer any questions. Um, but if not, feel free to hop off.